Netflix reported their earnings last week, and the stock rose around 11% because of the great results. And it made many people on Twitter coalesce around the success of Netflix and notice when Bill Ackman, a legendary hedge fund investor, sold the stock. Currently, there's posts like this going viral all across Twitter from Bar Chart. Remember when Bill Ackman capitulated and sold his Netflix position at the bottom, suffering a $400 million loss? And it has it circled right there. That is where Bill Ackman sold. This tweet has 500 likes. Brew Markets had another even more viral tweet saying that Bill Ackman sold his shares in Netflix right here. Once again, highlighting how Bill Ackman sold the stock during the dip. This one has 590,000 views and 6,000 likes. We also had Bucko Capital tweet that Netflix stock dropped 75% because of this, investing is hard. And it's a chart showing the total subscriber gain. During the short time period of six months where Netflix lost 1 million subscribers, on a base of 220 million, the stock dropped 75%. And that tweet again went viral with many people suggesting that investing is hard. In fact, it's so hard that it fools investors like Bill Ackman. Is it possible to be able to predict companies like Netflix? Is it just a game of luck? We're gonna be discussing in this episode. Now, of course, we have some other news to get to. Moody's just reported their earnings and the stock is down 4%. We're going to be taking a look at why the stock is trading lower, what's going wrong with the company. The Amazon cloud boss recently said that if employees are unhappy with the five-day workweek mandate, they can leave. This seemingly obvious statement made headlines because of the implications. We're going to be discussing the implications of this statement in this episode. We have news that Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, is seemingly at war with Microsoft. He is nonstop bashing Microsoft's AI agent, their co-pilot. He compares Microsoft's co-pilot to Clippy 2.0. What is Mark Benioff doing with Microsoft? Why is he so worried about Microsoft? And what does this mean about AI and all of these co-pilots and agents? We're gonna be discussing all of this plus much more on today's episode. Now let's go ahead and jump into the headline news here. People are finally starting to notice Netflix. I'm seeing it all over on social media. The sentiment has officially changed from being skeptical, being concerned about the company, talking about its many competitors, to now most investors realizing that it is the long-term winner. It is the globally dominant company. But even so, as we look at this third quarter report that just happened last week, I still believe the majority of investors don't see the real vision with Netflix. They don't see the reality of what's going on with the data. And I think in terms of looking at the future of Netflix, it's important to know what's actually going on right now. Investors are still missing the forest from the trees. The moat that Netflix is building is growing, and it's growing quickly. The flywheel is spinning now faster than ever. The distance between Netflix and second place and third place streaming services is getting wider and wider and wider every single day. Netflix's numbers that they put up were not just good, they were staggeringly good. These are numbers of a real fast growth company. The company grew its revenue by 15%, but on a constant currency basis, which means if you neutralize currency fluctuations, it grew at 21%. That's faster than the majority of big tech. That's faster than the majority of companies in the market today. Netflix is growing incredibly fast. The operating margins of Netflix, this most recent quarter, were 30% compared to a year earlier at 22%. We have fast revenue growth. We have operating margin expansion. The earnings per share of Netflix are growing rapidly. It grew 45% last quarter year over year. Netflix continues on its long march of subscriber gains quarter over quarter, year over year. This most recent quarter, they gained 5.07 million subscribers, which brings the total now to 282.72 million subscribers. All of them are paid subscriberships. So none of these are freemium members. All of them are paying to be a member of Netflix. Next quarter, management said they expect to gain over the amount of subscribers they gained this most recent quarter. So in Q4 of 2024, they will gain over 5 million subscribers. Next quarter, Netflix also has a stacked content slate. In Q4 of 2024 and going into 2025, they have more content coming out than they've ever had before. This year, Netflix's content was impeded by the writer strike. So they had a bumpy content schedule. It wasn't their normal drumbeat of steady releases of quality content, but that's gonna change going into the end of this year and next year. They have premium TV series coming out December, like Squid Game season two. These are some of the most popular viral shows ever in the history of television. They're at the center of the cultural zeitgeist. They have reality TV shows like Love is Blind season seven. They have the Mike Tyson, Jake Paul boxing match, which Everybody hates Jake Paul, nobody likes him, 
but everybody's going to watch this. Every single person you know will be watching this fight on Netflix. Netflix virtually owns stand-up comedy at this time, with every major stand-up comedian wanting deals with Netflix. That is the place to get your stand-up comedy. Management noted that Netflix's engagement, total time watched per household, increased year over year. It's now above two hours on average per day. This is levels of engagement that other streaming services would die for. Their new initiatives are doing well. The new ad tear, for example, is growing quickly. Last quarter, they noted that the ad tear grew 35% quarter over quarter. They also note that the ad tear is monetizing well. Between the price you pay, the $7, and the ads they show you, the ad tear makes about as much as their other paid tears. Netflix is also building their own ad tech platform that will be rolling out in Q4 of this year and going into 2025. This will make them less reliant on the trade desk and other ad platforms. On the financial side of Netflix, their balance sheet continues to strengthen. This quarter, they had $300 million more in cash than they did the previous quarter. Their debt leverage ratios continue to go down. This report top to bottom reflected one of the strongest companies in the market today. In terms of their capital allocation policy, Netflix is now at a point where they have so much money, so much money that they need to figure out what to do with it. This most recent quarter, they generated $2.19 billion in free cash flow. That is a record high quarterly free cash flow for Netflix. They raised their free cash flow guidance for 2024 from $6 billion to $6.5 billion. I still think they'll come above that closer to $7 billion for the year. The company is gushing cash flows. What are they doing with it? Well, they're aggressively and efficiently buying back shares. They continue to increase investors' equity in the company by reducing shares outstanding at a very fast pace. Overall, you can say that Netflix is running away with the lead, but I think that's incorrect. The real phrasing now is that Netflix has already won. They've already won. They've ran away with the lead already. They noted in the call that operating margins are expected to go up again next quarter and next year, operating margin guidance as they continue to spend more on content and improve their content overall. Netflix is at a point of scale now where it's difficult for the company to keep their operating margins lower. It's difficult to not have their operating margins expand. Think about what type of company that is, where it's tough to keep your operating margins down. They naturally just want to go up. The company is so scalable, so efficient with its spend, that it right now has 20% operating margins as of last year. They're predicting to have around 25% next year. I believe the normalization for Netflix and where this company's going ultimately is to have 500 million subscribers. When they have that many, I believe they'll have around 45 to 50% operating margins. The difference between now and then is still vast. The story for Netflix and the runway of growth is still very, very long. Netflix avoids many of the challenges that other companies have, many of the challenges of doing business with China. Netflix does no business with China. They don't have to worry about it. They don't do any business with Russia. They have an ample growth path with partners in countries that are already friendly to the US. So when I look at Netflix, I can look at it through the framework of just analyzing it like any other company with a PE ratio and a growth prospect, but I think that doesn't show the full picture here. I still view Netflix as a completely unique asset that is uniquely positioned to grow into the world of streaming, a company that is going to be highly profitable with both margin expansion and continued revenue growth. It'll have bumps and ebbs and flows along the way like it has during the past. But if you look at the big picture here, I still think this company is well on its way to a much brighter future. It's going to be difficult at this point for management to screw it up. It is their game to lose. They have a winner here. They are winning. All management needs to do is exercise half-decent judgment and keep this thing going in generally the right direction. So I'm still, at this point, very bullish on the company. It remains my largest position in the story fund, and I still believe it will have excess returns above the S&P 500 at this point. Now, when we look at what other investors are doing now, they're starting to finally notice Netflix. We have a post here from Bar Chart noting that Bill Ackman sold the company at the worst time possible. Now, we have the same thing from Brew Markets. This is the more viral post. Bill Ackman sold his shares in Netflix here, and he highlights this here. My first thought on this is, this is technically correct. He did sell Netflix very close, almost at the exact bottom, which was not optimal. And I didn't agree with him. I actually wrote that uh, I think Bill Ackman is wrong here. I think he's wrong to sell the company. He said the company was not predictable. I said, I think the company is one of the most predictable companies in the market. So we had a disagreement of opinion, 
But there's a couple things left out here that I think are a little bit harsh on Bill Ackman. One of them is that although he did sell it at the bottom here, he didn't buy it at the top. It's not like he bought here and sold there. That's not what happened. He bought the company right here. So he bought it a little bit higher. He took a 30% loss and then he sold, suffering a 300 plus million dollar loss. Not optimal. That's one of the worst trades I think that I've seen from a professional hedge fund manager like Bill Ackman. So I was a little shocked at how quickly he sold the company after the bad report. I, I thought it was a bit of an impulsive decision, especially from someone that runs an entire firm and has as many people involved. I think he should have just waited. There wasn't much lower that Netflix could go. But regardless, he did sell at that point. Another thing that I would point out in defense of Bill Ackman is although he sold Netflix at the bottom, he also bought Google at the same time. Google was trading around $80 to $90 per share, which is around half the price it trades today. So even though he did sell Netflix, he did buy Google with that money and Google did really well. Now, Google did not do nearly as well as Netflix. Google went up around double. If he would have held on to Netflix, that went up around three and a half times. So Netflix far outperformed his decision to put that capital into Google. I wish Bill Ackman had held on to Netflix, but he decided not to. Ultimately, I did not buy into Netflix because Bill Ackman bought it. I owned it before him and I wasn't going to sell because he sold it. So his purchase of Netflix had nothing to do with my investment in this company. Another thing pointed out online right now is a bit of hindsight investing. A lot of people pointing out that Netflix stock dropped 75% because of this. That little move down in subscribers. Netflix lost 1 million subscribers on a base of 220 million and the stock dropped 75% as a result. And he notes that investing is hard. A lot of people are noting that this is why you shouldn't pick individual stocks because you really don't know what to expect. It's hard to predict. Nobody could have predicted that Netflix would recover like it did. And I don't think that's the message that should be shared here. I think the reason that investing is hard is because most investors follow along with the sentiment of the general crowd. They follow along with the general public. The reason that Netflix stock dropped as much as it did during this time period is because everybody all at once became very bearish on the company. The sentiment immediately moved to the negative as soon as their subscriber growth halted. As soon as subscribers went flat for even two quarters, the sentiment was destroyed. Hedge fund managers were selling out. People were updating their models to Netflix now having no future growth at all. Consider that. Netflix has a pullback in subscribers for two quarters, and now they're no longer a growth company ever again in the history or in future. They can never grow again because they had growth halt for two quarters. Instantly, investors extrapolated out a long future based on the most recent quarter. The exact opposite of what you're supposed to do as any type of perceptive investor. If we look at one of the most interesting facts during this time of Netflix failing, the time period where investors sold out and the stock dropped 75% was right here. This is the net subscriber gain or loss per quarter. And you'll notice that throughout Netflix's entire history, they've always gained net subscribers every single quarter. Every three months, they're adding, they're adding, they're adding. And then we had two quarters in a row. One right here, Q1 of 2022, and then Q2 of 2022, where they lost subscribers. These two little bars right there, going in the negative, are the only ones in the negative since the beginning of Netflix the very beginning of the company. And these two bars alone were enough to change the sentiment of Netflix to a dead company, one that had been outcompeted, one that is no longer growing at all ever again in the future. One of the funny things about this is even if you zoomed out a little bit and you just looked at it on a trailing 12 month basis. So over the course of a full year, on a trailing 12 month basis, Netflix never had a period where they lost subscribers. So even during Q1 of 2022 and Q2, they gained 14 million over the past year and 11 million over the last year. The lowest they ever got was in Q4 of 2022, where they only gained 9 million additional subscribers. So by widening the scope of view to just one year, Netflix has always been a growth company. But that is the power of sentiment. Sentiment changes everything with the stock. It changes the valuation. It changes viewer perception of the stock. Right now, sentiment of Netflix is very positive. Investors love the company. They view all the positive qualities of it. Reasonably so, I think it should be positive. But just a couple of years ago, the Netflix sentiment was so negative. Investors viewed this company with so much discouragement that there's no price too low. Even the best investors in the world, the seeming hedge fund managers, the smart money, were convinced to sell out of this asset 
during the very bottom. So no, I don't believe the takeaway here is to avoid investing in great companies like Netflix because they're too unpredictable at certain points. The takeaway here is to not buy into the general sentiment at the time. Don't be so excited when everyone else is excited. Don't be so sad when everyone else is sad. Those type of sentiments is what drives poor performance in stocks. We should control our temperament. Our temperament is how we behave given certain scenarios. We should be investors that are not so excited when the stock market goes up. We're not so sad when the stock market goes down. We focus on the fundamentals, the long-term perspective. We shouldn't be manipulated by the need to follow along with the pack, agree with everyone and what their thoughts are. We should look at things with clear eyes and an unbiased nature. If you did that with Netflix in 2022, you had incredible results. If you did that with many other companies during bearish time periods with Amazon, when that was trading down, you had incredible results. If you did that with Google, when it was down at $80 per share, you had incredible results. All of these results are accomplished by avoiding the general sentiment around the stock, not by looking at it in a biased way, negative or positive, but looking at it through the facts, through the fundamentals. And as an investor, if you're not able to avoid following every general sentiment at the given time of that sentiment, then your results are gonna suffer. Whether or not you're buying into individual stocks or ETFs, if you are a sentiment-driven investor, your results will suffer. Now let's go ahead and move on to Moody's. Moody's, of course, is one of my holdings, and the reported earnings this morning, the stock moved down around 4% after reporting their earnings. Now, of course, you can look at this and just assume that there's something wrong with the earnings or it was disappointing, something must have been negative for it to move down, but that doesn't really seem like it's the case here. And this is how it works in some cases. I've seen companies post really good earnings where the stock moves down after earnings, and ones where companies post really poor earnings where the stock moves up. A lot of it is due to expectations, algorithmic trading, options markets, lots of different things drive short-term price movements. On their own earnings presentation, Moody's has the key takeaways, and I really think that this just outlines what happened in a very brief and concise manner. Number one, Moody's delivered record-breaking results. Their Q3 revenue grew by 23%. Their earnings per share increased by 30%. They say number two, Moody's Investor Services, which is the credit rating portion, again achieved record Q3 revenues. Moody's Analytics, their subscription portion, produced solid annual recurring revenue growth that grew around 9%. Number four, they increased their full year guidance over their current expectations. And number five, they note that the cyclical and secular tailwinds are driving future growth. These results were great results. Some of it is already baked into the price. That's why the stock is down a little bit today. But over a longer period, Moody's will continue to grow as their earnings power and free cash flow continue to grow. Now, moving on with the earnings reports, we get into some news here. Amazon's cloud boss recently made a statement that, well, it ruffled a lot of feathers. It made a lot of people upset because of it, it, just the tone of it, I guess, the implications of it. He says that employees unhappy with five-day office mandate can leave. So we know that Amazon recently just required all employees to be in the office five days. They have their reasons for doing it, but of course, a lot of people are unhappy with it. During COVID, people got accustomed to working from home. They saw the benefits of having more autonomy over their schedule and time. And obviously, a lot of people enjoy that. Being able to work from home a few days a, a week is a, a nice benefit from a job. But Amazon management doesn't see it that way. They believe it hurts the teamwork and culture of the company, that they're not able to accomplish as much by working at home as they are in office. So each of them have their reasons. And now Amazon is requiring these employees to come back into the office. And of course, a lot of employees are unhappy. Now, this statement from the Amazon cloud boss has a lot of people upset about it, a lot of scrutiny about it. There's been entire CNBC debates and people looking into this statement, which is kind of funny when you consider the fact that it's a completely obvious statement. He's just stating a fact here. If you don't like the policies from Amazon, you can leave just like any other job in existence, unless you're on a contractual basis. Amazon is an at will employer. If you don't like it for any reason, you can leave. If you just don't feel like working at Amazon, you can leave. If you don't like who you're working with, your team lead, your, the company culture, any requirements, you can leave. You're not trapped there. Nobody's forcing people to work at Amazon. So the employees complaining about Amazon are complaining about a situation that's entirely in their power to change. Now, of course, it may cause some disruption in their life to quit Amazon and work somewhere else, but that's always the option. And Amazon, likewise, can fire anybody. They can fire employees if they're not performing well or for other given reasons. 
That's the benefit of at-will employment. Now, this statement, even though it's completely obvious, does have some implications. And I think this gets to the greater meaning of what's going on right now. Amazon employs over 400 PhD economists. This is one of the largest teams of economists only surpassed by the Fed in the United States. So Amazon has a team of people scouring over all of the data, looking at the demand for employees. And if the Amazon cloud boss is saying that they're okay with employees being unhappy and quitting, they're also saying a lot of other things. He's also saying that they're fine with people quitting. They don't need you. Go ahead and quit. It doesn't hurt Amazon. In fact, he may also be saying that Amazon not only doesn't need you, but they might want you to quit. If you're the type of person that has such a big problem with coming into an office, this may actually be a natural filtration system to only have the most dedicated employees working at Amazon. So it may accomplish two different things for Amazon. They can have people quit cutting down on their labor expense while not paying out severance. If you willingly quit, you don't get the same severance package than if you're fired. So this is a way of Amazon doing a form of silent layoffs, making it so that some employees leave and they don't have to pay the additional expense. They're also saying that they see a very strong labor market. No longer is Amazon desperate for tech employees. Tech employees were in incredible amounts of demand in 2020 when everybody was hiring them. You could see the stats of new employees being hired, them wanting huge pay raises, some of them demanding incredible pay packages from these companies. That was during a time where tech companies like Amazon had a desperation to hire, hire, and hire. We saw companies like Google hire 50,000 employees in only a six month period. But that time period seems to be over. They don't need employees right now. And if they do in the future, they can just hire different ones. So there's a lot of implications with this statement from Amazon. But I think the biggest takeaway here is that Amazon is in good shape with their labor force. They have all the talent they need. They're fine with people quitting. And they're not in a situation of desperation to alter their policies at the demands of employees. Another thing I'll just mention as a side note is the headline of this article is very... It's almost like rude, a little bit pompous, just saying you can leave. And that's not actually what he said. If you look at the actual statement here, we can just read the actual direct quote from the Amazon cloud boss. He says, quote, if there are people who just don't work well in that environment and don't want to, that's okay. There's other companies around. At Amazon, we wanna be in an environment where we're working together. And we feel the collaborative environment is incredibly important for our innovation and for our culture. So it's a bit of a different tone between what he actually said and what's being reported in the headlines. The headlines make it sound like he just said, if you don't like it, shut up or leave. That's not what he said. That wasn't actually the message he shared. He said, we have a certain culture we wanna have at Amazon. If it doesn't fit with you personally, luckily there's a lot of other companies that may be a better fit. That's a much, uh, I think, better way of phrasing it. But either way, right now, it looks like Amazon has no plans of changing their in-office work mandate. Now, moving on, we have news in the ongoing battle of the AI co-pilots and agents. This time, Microsoft seeming to be following the lead of Salesforce and now competing directly with them with the new announcement of an autonomous agent that they say to scale your team like never before. This just came out yesterday. Microsoft made this big announcement and it and it caused a little bit of a ruckus with Salesforce. They say first, the ability to create autonomous agents with Copilot Studio will be in public preview next month. Second, we're introducing 10 new autonomous agents in Dynamic 365. Dynamic 365 is Microsoft's version of a CRM. It's, it's like the most competitive portion of Microsoft directly to Salesforce. And they say that they're launching the 10 new autonomous agents to build capacity for every sales, service, finance, and supply chain team. Microsoft says that Copilot is your AI assistant. It works for you. The Copilot Studio enables you to easily create, manage, and connect agents to Copilot. Think of agents as a new app for an AI-powered world. Every organization will have a constellation of agents, ranging from simple prompt and response to fully autonomous. They'll work on behalf of an individual, team, or function to execute and orchestrate business processes. Copilot is how you'll interact with these agents, and they'll do everything from accelerating lead generation and processing sales orders to automating your supply chain. Now, I'm trying to wrap my head around this, but it seems like Microsoft is trying to create an entire org structure for AI. Like they, they have the copilot, which is like the, the manager, it's like the director. And then underneath the copilot, you have the agents that do individual jobs with that copilot being in charge of all those agents. 
So if you want to interact with an agent, you go to the manager, which is the copilot, and you say, hey, copilot, this agent is misbehaving or it needs to be reprogrammed. It needs to focus on a different task. And the copilot works with the agent. This is the point that we've gotten to. We already have org structures with artificial intelligence. Now, obviously, this is a great announcement for Microsoft. They're coming out with new products. They're staying relevant. They're using their huge distribution to continue to compete with all different types of companies. But one person is not happy about this. One person in particular who has been on a campaign against Microsoft's AI. Here's just a few things that the CEO of Salesforce has said about Microsoft over the past six months. Co-pilot experience for so many customers has become the clippy experience. What I mean by that is they're just not getting the value that they want. We just don't see co-pilot as that key step for our future. In some ways, they kind of looked at co-pilot as the new Microsoft Clippy. And I get that. Now, I'm old enough to remember what Clippy was in Microsoft. I know some of my younger viewers won't have a clue what it is, but it was that annoying little paper clip that would pop up and it really did not do much useful. It was just like a pop-up spam thing that gave you some ideas or something, but it, it wasn't a useful tool. Mark Benioff continues to brand Microsoft's Copilot like Clippy 2.0. Just today, he posted that Microsoft is rebranding Copilot as agents. That's panic mode. Let's be real, Copilot's a flop because Microsoft lacks the data, metadata, and enterprise security models to create real corporate intelligence. And then he has a massive picture of Microsoft's Copilot being crossed out. So he is doing a branding effort here. Mark Benioff is trying to brand Microsoft as Clippy, and it remains to be seen whether or not this effort will be successful. We don't see too many instances like this where a CEO of one company goes so directly against one of their competitors, trying to brand their products as being outdated, antiquated, and worthless. And again, I don't really know whether or not this branding effort will work. I tend to believe it won't. But Mark Benioff has been competing directly with Microsoft for decades. He understands the competitive landscape. He's one that has really done well, even in the wake of Microsoft. So I think on this one, we can give him the benefit of the doubt. But overall, when I look at this type of news and I see these companies coming out with virtually the same tools, the same processes, it makes me wonder how much of AI is going to be commoditized, how easy it is to create these agents or these co-pilots. Is it only companies like Microsoft and Salesforce that can do it? Are there gonna be more and more companies like this? Is it gonna be so common that it's basically a commodity? That remains to be seen. Right now, I'm still skeptical of the ultimate value of these type of AI implementations. But that's gonna be it for this episode. Hope you enjoyed. See you in the next one.